Bibles open. I want to start reading at verse 1. When you have it, say amen. 1 Kings chapter 19, reading at verse 1. I'm reading from the English Standard Version of the Bible. This is how my Bible reads. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me and more also if I do not take your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid and he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba which belongs to Judah and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree and he asked that he might die, saying, It is enough now, O Lord, take my life, for I'm no better than my father's. And he lay down and slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water, and he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of the food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mount of God. Then he came to a cave, lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I've been very, very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek to take it away. And he said, Go, stand on the mount before God. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great strong wind tore the mountains and broke it in pieces, the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, Elijah, what are you doing here? Verse 18, yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. I want to talk about with the Lord's help in your prayers, stepping back into the right direction. Stepping back into the right direction. Peter Marshall was the highly revered chaplain of the U.S. Senate. In his biography that captured his life entitled, A Man Called Peter Marshall, there is a recounting of how the Lord saved him from a near death experience. One day while he was traveling in one of the Scottish villages on a dark starless night, Peter was walking through an open wasteland that was high with poor drainage. He decided that he would take a shortcut. He was aware that there was a deserted limestone pit that was within the dark space that he traveled. Peter thought that he could avoid the dangerous walk. There was an eerie darkness, the sound of wind, the echo of his footsteps as he walked down this dangerous path. Suddenly, he heard someone called, called him Peter. Peter. There was great urgency in his voice. He stopped and said, yes, who is it? What do you want? For a second, he listened, but there was no response. Only the sound of the swirling wind. The area that was dark, it seemed completely deserted, thinking he must have been mistaken that he heard a voice. He continued to walk a few more spaces. And then again, he heard the voice even more urgently. Peter, Peter, he stopped. Dead in his tracks, 
attempting to look in the impenetrable darkness, but suddenly he fell to his knees, putting out his hands to catch himself. He found nothing there. He cautiously investigated, feeling around in a semicircle. He found himself on the verge of a plank that led into a pit. Just one more step would have sent him plummeting into a space of undeniable death. Someone here this morning is on the plank of emotional despair. You're burdened with the complexities of your own identity, the constant pressure to succeed, the always depleting emotional capacity, the demands to meet everyone's expectations. You're on the plank. You're trying to keep your balance, but one wrong move, it could all be over. Can I tell you something, church? Our emotional health is no laughing matter. Depression is real. Our complex emotions are real. Our, our phobias are real. And even our struggles with low self-esteem. Today, I want to be like that anonymous voice to Peter Marshall to keep you from falling in a deadly pit. Our text this morning, we have Elijah at first glance. He's strong, he's focused, he's aligned with his purpose in God. God's hand is on Elijah's life. In chapter 18, Elijah stands up on the behalf of God. He stands against the prophets of Baal and God manifests himself on a wet altar by fire. This is a side note, God has a way of showing up even when the deck is stacked against him. Now, Elijah, the opening of chapter 19, God's prophet is not as strong as he was in chapter 18. Oh, how fast the pages of our lives turn. One day you're strong, the next day you're weak. And listen, noticeably, he's fatigued, he's overwhelmed with the feelings of being inadequate in the midst of overwhelming circumstances. God knows what Elijah needs. He sends angels to encourage Elijah not to take another step in the direction of emotional despair. This is the take-home truth this morning, church. God employs the proper voice and perspective to keep us from being destroyed by our own mental anguish. I think I say that again. God employs the proper voice and perspective to keep us from being destroyed by our own mental anguish. This is the deed to do. Move with God knowing he offers alternatives for our anxieties and anguish. And this is the word. If you're going to step in the right direction, the first thing is this. You have to step into being God-centered rather than situation-centered. The text opens. With Elijah, he's received a death threat from Queen Jezebel and Ahab. He's on the run to take his life, and he sits under a juniper tree. And Elijah, who was once a source of inspiration, strong in the Almighty God, strategic in his engagements, and sure in his calling, he's now on the run, and he's full of dreaded fear. The problem with Elijah is this. He gave too much credit to Jezebel and not enough credit to God. I think i say it again. Rewind, press play. He gave too much credit to Jezebel and not enough credit to God. Elijah forgot that Jezebel was created and God was the creator. Listen, when you just focus on your situation more than you focus on God, you will always be hopeless and overwhelmed. And remember this, the worst situation is seasonal. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor. Even the worst situation 
is seasonal. Listen, winter eventually has to give in to spring. Spring has to give in to summer. Summer has to give in to fall. Listen, no matter what your situation is, your season can overwhelm God. Stop thinking that your situation is the first and only situation. Listen, it's the enemy's job to get you to move your focus and if you only focus on what's wrong, what's challenging, you will stop focusing on the who of life and always focus on the what. In him, we live and move and we have our being. Listen, stop focusing on the situation. Everybody has a situation. But this is the second move I want to share with you. You have to step into your human metrics. The Lord employs an angel to speak to the burdened spirit. The response of Elijah is troubling. Verse 10 and 14, when God speaks to him, he starts reading God his righteous resume. Lord, I'm the only one you got left. Lord, I'm the only one that's been bowing down to you. I'm the only one that has been trusting in your name. Listen, Elijah develops a Messiah complex feeling as if he's the only one. Do you have the tendency to do that? That you start thinking that you're the only one just because you're the oldest in your family? You're the only one responsible just because you have a high paying job? Everybody has to depend on you just because you have have a few letters uh, behind your name. You're the only strong person in the room. Can I tell you something? We are not God. We are simply used by God. We are very human. Listen, no matter, this is a word for spiritual people. Listen, no matter how spiritual you are, you are still human. You have the tendency to be flawed, fragile, and life has a way of making you frustrated. You are human. When we start thinking that God doesn't have anybody else, the process of experiencing transform transformation in our emotional health is realizing this, we are human and we need God. L -l Listen, you're not that smart. You're not that strong. That's why you're always frustrated. That's why you're always snapping on everybody because you start taking the place of God. No, you don't say you're God, but you move so much that you can't even hear God speak. You always have to be at the front of the line. You always have to be leading the endeavor and no one is leading you because we are human. It's simple. When you step into your human metrics, you realize you need recreation. Let the church say recreation. Sometimes you're so engaged in being Superman, Superwoman, Supermom, Superdad, the boss, the employee. Your life is full and you're moving passionately, often never taking a break. You're always under pressure, moving, 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 and moving. And listen, if pressure busts pipes, what do you think pressure will do to you? Elijah was working for God, but he soon realized that he was not God. Listen, recreation allows you to recreate yourself, and sometimes you just need a break, a vacation, a staycation, dinner with friends. You're not that busy not to take a break. If you're going to step into your human metrics, you got to pay attention to your diet. Let the church say diet. I know this doesn't sound spiritual, but look at the text again. Elijah was so stressed out, he started out running. And he, he was running so hurriedly, he failed to eat. Child of God, your diet directly impacts your ability to focus. Maybe you're so mentally disturbed because you abuse your body. Sometimes you're not eating enough to give your body fuel and balance. But then there are other times we do the opposite. We overeat trying to find a high from the food that we intake. If you're like me, you'll find yourself living to eat instead of eating to live. Am I helping you today? You have to step 
into being God-centered rather than situation-centered. You have to step into your human metrics, know your own limitations, but then finally, and I'm done today, you have to step into life-giving disciplines. Elijah's life is no different from our lives. There are times we're up. There are other times we're down. There are times where life is so good where it feels like you have the mightiest touch. Have you ever been there? Everything you touch turns to gold. Have you been there? But then there are other days when it seems like you have a season of lack of productivity and failure. The question is, what do we do to maintain our emotional well-being when it seems like our lives are spiraling out of control? Or what do we do to keep our lives from spiraling out of control? I suggest we must step into practices that will encourage positive mental health. This is the first one. You got to learn how to practice silence. Hmm. Silence. After Elijah expressed his mental anguish to the Lord, the Lord shows up and gives him an abstract revealing of himself. The text says the wind came, cracked the bosom of the mountain. There are pieces all around like children play with Legos. Then he comes in an earthquake, but God was not in the earthquakes like in California. Then he says it was a fire, not like the fire when Moses, when God speaks to Moses and sets the bush on fire but is not consumed. But the text says God was not in the fire, but Listen what the text says. There was a still, small voice. When you read that in the original language, it reads like this. In silence, God speaks. I think I'll say that again. In silence, God speaks. The word for someone is you might have the volume of your existence turned up too loud that it causes you distraction. Maybe you have so much going on that it causes you to be agonizing over all the things that you have to do. Listen, oftentimes God can restore us to a place of peace if we learn just how to be silent. Let the church say be silent. Sometimes you don't always need the trap music. Sometimes you don't need the conversation of a companion, the advice of a friend, the noise of a lounge, the notification of a message or an email. Sometimes you just need silence, and sometimes God uses silence as his megaphone. Silence. But then also... Spirituality. What is your practice when your feelings have been hurt and the perpetrators of your pain are still at large? What do you do when you ticked off? You know they hurt you. They know they hurt you. And everybody else knows they hurt you. Sometimes I'll tell you what we do. We place our religion on the shelf. But can I tell you something, church? Transformation in our mental health becomes a reality when we decide to be spiritual. Listen, spirituality, let me give you a working definition of spirituality. Spirituality is living and practicing harmony with God and with others. Listen, I came to tell you this morning, you can't be spiritual if you can't be in harmony with God and other people. When you're in right relationship with God, it forces you to try to get along with other people, even the people that you don't care for that much. Listen, our journey with God is the medicine that we need that keeps us from becoming enemies with the world and everybody else around us. Let me tell you what spirituality is not. Spirituality is not jargon. Spirituality is not how many highlights you have in your Bible and how high you jump in the sanctuary. Spirituality is not about what you say, but it's about your harmony with God, and it's a responsible journey. Spirituality is, I try to make sure my hips match my lips. I'm done today. Finally, if you're going to step in the right direction, you need to surrender. 
Life is indeed challenging. Life is overwhelming. Can we be honest this morning? Life is tough. But well, often our greatest mistake that causes us energy is oftentimes we try to hold our lives too tightly in our own hands. And it begins to stretch us and stress us. Elijah's problem and our problem, we are constantly plagued with the thought that life is about us. We start thinking that we're stronger than what we really are. We end up being more serious than what we have to be, and we end up carrying more stress than what we should have to carry. Listen, God calls you and I to complete surrender. Let the church say surrender. surrender. Peace and purpose is never discovered outside of a life that surrendered to God. Listen to me. If you don't hear anything else I've said this morning, listen, you can't pick up the fragmented pieces of your life until you make Christ authority and king of everything. When Christ is king and lord of everything, it doesn't erase life, but it makes life more endurable and enjoyable. When Christ is rest and leads over all things, you can maintain your mental equilibrium when everything else in the world is moving. Even when it seems like you have vertigo, God can give you some peace that will help you to maintain your center. I'm done today. The story's told about a Russian picture entitled Checkmate. Checkmate is the general term that means you've defeated your opponent. It's often the nomenclature that is used in the game of chess when there is no way to move. The Russian picture checkmate was hung up in a gallery and people came from miles and miles and miles around to admire its beauty. Church, it was deemed as a masterpiece. They admired this picture entitled Checkmate, but there was a man in the back of the room that began to shout, it's a lie, it's a lie, it's a lie. You could hear the people gasping for breath and they looked at him with surprise. He says, go back and look in the corner of the picture, he says the king still has another move. Lean in, child of God. Life sometimes feels like it's checkmate and your marriage feels like it's checkmate. Your children act like it's checkmate and everything in the world says you have nowhere to move but look back in the corner of the picture of your life. God still has another move. Who is the king of glory? The Lord God strong and mighty lift up your head oh ye gates and be ye lifted up ye everlasting doors and the king of glory shall come in look at your neighbor say God has an invitation for you he says, come unto me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden. Come to me with your depression. Come to me with you being bipolar. Come to me with your low self-esteem. And take my yoke upon you. And my burdens are easy. And I make your burdens light. To the glory of God. Look at your neighbor and say, God will give you rest. Today, if you're here unsaved, unchurched, Today is a good day to say, I want to step in the right direction. And listen, you can't step in the right direction without God. Today, if you're here, unsaved, unchurched, step out from wherever you are. Today's a good day.